How are the comics on that thing any good? Yeah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 the I'm here. I thought I wanted to pick them up. <laughs> So this is the impossible boundary. <laughs> it's actually an imaginary boundary above everyone's heads. Okay. One above everybody's head? Okay. Oh, okay. Let me tell you a story. <laughs> when the, I work in Hong Kong for a few years, in Hong Kong there's a road called Boundary Road. It's somewhere in Kowloon. And this road is a road that if you are a refugee in the olden days, if you're able to swim from China to Hong Kong, and you can swim below this boundary road and you're free, you can become a Hong Kong resident and stay back in Hong Kong. But if you're arrested before you pass south, south of the boundary road, you have to be sent back to China. So this reminds me of the boundary road. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. So if you if you don't rise above the boundary road, you will get forever down there. Okay. So I learned another such philosophy class. <laughs> okay. Talking about frequency response, h of omega, and h of omega is nothing but the ratio between the input, which is the phasor, um, output, okay, output over the input. Okay, so this could be a ratio between two phasor quantities. And remember that these are all phasors. Okay? When you take the ratio of two phasors, and they have to be at the same frequency. And that re frequency is the operating frequency, and the ratio of that output to input is called the frequency response. And in other uh, terms, you might see this uh, word transfer function. Okay? Very simple, just that. Okay? Nothing more complicated than that. And we did a very simple example of this phasor circuit that if we have a capacitor here, and then you're asked to find the output versus the input in this phasor circuit. This is R, and this is the capacitance with value C, and then Vr over Vn at a driven frequency would be called a frequency response. And it would be a ratio of the output to the input, and you can work out the formula right away using the voltage divider formula. The impedance of a capacitor, what is that? Impedance of a capacitor equals? One over J omega. Very good, very good. All of you are awake today. And then what should you divide by? And using the voltage divider formula. <coughs> The sum of the two impedances. Very good. Very good. Okay? And then what should you multiply by? Oh, sorry. 
you don't have to multiply by anything here. Okay, it's already there. So that is the ratio of the output to the input. Of course, you can simplify this and write this as J omega RC plus one. Okay, and you can plot this <coughs> magnitude of H of omega. You can plot this, and if you plot this, then if you take the magnitude of this, it will be same as taking the magnitude of this thing, omega square RC square plus one, and then taking the square root of. Okay, and then what about the the phase angle, the phase angle of H of omega, which I usually like to call it as theta, that equals the phase angle of the denominator in the complex number, and then putting a negative sign in front of that. Okay, if you have a complex number, in order to find the phase angle of this complex number, you don't have to invert it. You can think of it as a polar form. Okay, if you express the denominator into a polar form, you will be a magnitude something like this, into a polar form. So if you know the phase angle of the denominator, it will be negative of the phase angle for the numerator. Okay, so we don't have to invert this if you don't want, you can work out the phase angle right away. That phase angle is up 10 of two numbers, the ratio of two numbers. What are those two numbers that I have to take ratios? The ratio of? Vibasia? Omega RC. Omega RC and, and 1, right? Omega RC and 1. And then I'm still wrong. This formula is still wrong. What do I need to augment it with in order to make it correct? Put a minus sign. Okay? <coughs> So if you were to plot this function, h of omega, I'm going a little bit fast because we went over this in class in the last lecture. Okay? If you were to plot this, it has a maximum at omega equals zero. So it will have a maximum value over here. Okay, when omega is equal to zero, it just equal to one. But then as you increase omega, this thing drops off like this. Okay. And that is how the frequency response or the transfer function looks like. What about the angle? The angle, if we plot this as a function of frequency, so when omega is positive, it will be a positive big number. Up tangent of a big number is equal to your xiao xiu li, right? Xiao xiu li. Li xiao su. Li xiao su. Yeah. Li xiao su. Okay. So what is the tangent of a big number? Pi over two. Pi over two. Very good. Okay. Pi over two, but they have a negative sign over here. So when omega is very large, then the angle is minus pi over two. And then as you go to negative omega, this becomes uh, plus pi over 2 because of this minus sign. So the, the phase angle will look something like this. Okay? So this is called a low pass filter. Why is it called a low pass filter? The reason why it's called a low pass filter is that you think about transferring the signal from the input to the output. Okay? Transferring the signal from the input to the output. Only the low frequency signals can pass through the system. That's what this picture is saying. When the frequency is high, the transfer function or the frequency response is very small. You have to multiply the input by a very small number in order to get the output. Okay? So only the low frequency signals go through. The phase is something that is harder to understand, but in the future, you will understand why the phase behaves like that. But let's try to understand physically why the frequency response is like that. Why is it that only <coughs> low frequency signals can pass through the system? What is the, yes? Because when the capacitor is charged fully, then the V out will be the exact same as V in. 
Why is the capacitor charge cooling? Because it's in parallel. But yes, but what is peculiar about making the capacitor charge fully and making it into an open circuit? When the capacitor is fully charged, it becomes an open circuit. Then the voltage drop will be entirely across the open circuit. Okay, when does the capacitor appear like an open circuit? When the frequency is low, that is the physical property of a capacitor, okay? When the frequency is low, if you try to send an AC signal into the capacitor, if you send the signal in slowly, you have the chance to charge up the capacitor, and it becomes an open circuit, okay? So at very low frequency, this behaves like an open circuit. You get maximum frequency response for that reason, because this is a voltage divider. But as the frequency goes up, what happens to the impedance of the capacitor? It goes to be smaller and smaller, and eventually to be zero if the frequency is high enough. Why is that so? What is the physical reason for that? Because it doesn't have time to the capacitor fully charge. So yes, that's smaller. correct. If you now try to charge the capacitor rapidly, okay, it doesn't have even a chance to be fully charged. It's, all, it's always undercharged. Because it's always undercharged, it always looks like a short circuit to high frequency signal. Okay? So the capacitance has an impedance that looks like that for that reason. Okay? At low frequency, the impedance is very high, but high frequency, the impedance is very low because you don't have a chance to charge up the capacitor. So at high frequency, this becomes a short circuit. So the voltage drop across this thing becomes very small. And that's why you have this frequency response that appears to be that way. Okay, that is called the low pass filter. Let's think of another one, or let's go to another one in the in the textbook, which is uh, looking something like this. You have V in, and then you have a capacitor somewhere here, and then you have V out. Okay, you have R, you have C, and if you use the voltage divider formula. V out over V in, okay, very similar to that, will be R divided by the total impedance, which is 1 over K omega C over D. Okay? And I can simplify this to be J omega R C over J omega R C plus 1. Okay? In the textbook, they take R and C to be 1. Okay, out of love this to be one. So in the textbook it simplifies to this expression. Okay, if R C equals one. Okay? Now if you look at the transfer function, the transfer function will be just that. Okay, J omega J omega plus one. And if you plot the magnitude of this, okay, if you plot the magnitude of this, what will happen to the numerator? If you, take the, if you take the magnitude of a complex number, it's the same as taking the magnitude of the numerator divided by the magnitude of the denominator. Okay, you can take that separately. So if you take the magnitude of the numerator, you get plus uh, magnitude of omega. If you take the magnitude of the denominator, you get the same thing as what you had previously. Okay, you get omega squared plus 1. Okay, you get that. And then what about the angle? Angle will be slightly complicated here, okay, because it's not just a simple function like this. It has a numerator and a denominator. And if you work out the angle, okay, it will be the angle of the denominator, okay, which is negative sine plus the 90 degrees phase shift. Okay, so you have this angle, okay, but you have to add 90 degrees phase shift to it, and so what you have to do is that if you think of adding 90 degrees phase shift to this picture, okay, if you're over here, you will have to add, let me look at my answer, okay, the answer is like this, it will look something like, let me not draw over there, let me draw over here. Okay, think of adding 90 degrees phase shift to this picture. Because this is what this does. This gives you a plus 90 degree. 
in addition to this angle that you had previously. So if you were to add 90 degrees to zero, you get something like this. And then you would add 90 degrees to all this, you get something like this. So theta will look something like this, and then for the other half, it will look something like that. Okay? The angle is harder to comprehend physically, but if you were to look at the... Okay, you can work out the formula for theta as well. It would be arctangent or something quite complicated, which I wouldn't work out. But if you were to plot this now, let me plot it over here. If you were to plot h bar h of omega magnitude, and then this is omega over square root of omega squared plus one, okay? And if you were to plot this function, it will look something like this. What is its value at the origin? What happens when omega equals zero? Zero. zero. Okay? And then when omega becomes very large, what happens to its value? One. It becomes one. So it has a characteristic that looks something like this. It has to be symmetrical. Okay, one. Okay? This is called the high pass filter. Why is it called the high pass filter? It does not allow DC signal or low frequency <coughs> signals to go through the system. However, it just let high frequency signal go through the system with no problem. What is the physical reason for that? Why well, if you contemplate and look at this circuit again, what happens when the frequency is low? What happens to the capacitor when it sees the low frequency? Yes? It fills up, uh, it fills up the capacitor and it becomes an open. Yeah, the capacitor gets charged up very easily and becomes an open circuit. So most of the voltage drop will be across this open circuit and very little voltage drop across here. Okay, that's why you have H of omega looking like this. The, the frequency response to the transfer function looks something like that. Okay, but once the frequency gets higher, the capacitor becomes like a short circuit and most of the voltage drop will be across the resistor and you see a behavior that, part, that is something like this, okay? So, yes? How do you get theta? If there's no equation for it, I don't really see how one half of the graph was up, the other half was down. Oh, I, I just get it from this picture. I say that the total phase angle of this function is the phase angle of the denominator. Okay? Making it negative and then add 90 degrees to it. Because the J, if you multiply the number by J, you're going to change its phase angle by 90 degrees. Okay, you're not going to change its phase angle by other than that, 90 degrees. So I add 90 degrees to this picture on its right and on its left. Okay? Uh, on its left, I have to add minus 90 degrees because omega becomes negative. Okay, so on the right, I add plus 90 degrees. On the left, I add minus 90 degrees. I get this to be that. You can work out the formula, it's rather complicated. Okay, but you can actually visually see the answer without having to work out the formula that the phase angle has to look something like that. Any other questions? Okay, everything is clear, right? Transfer function, frequency response, and everything else. So let's do a very complicated example, uh, as is in the textbook. Example 5.3, okay? The phase of circuit looks something like this. An inductor, capacitor, and then the output is called Y. Okay, the input is called F. 
Okay. I don't know why they changed the name, but the output is y, the input is x. Okay? How do you find the transfer of function? Well, you can see that uh, if this is a current source, okay, y, if this is representing a voltage drop, y is just equal to <coughs> the input impedance times i, which in this case is the input impedance times f. Okay? The book uses f, so I just follow the book. What is z that you should find here? The parallel impedances of the three elements connected in parallel. Okay? So this is r, this is c, then actually you can find the admittance uh, I hate to use the symbol Y here. Okay, let me call Y O. Uh, the admittance of this thing is parallel is that you just add there admittances. Okay, this is the admittance of the three things in parallel. And you have to add this up. Okay, and then reciprocate it. And the book makes it very easy for you. R equals 1, L equals 1, C equals 1. Okay, so that expression greatly simplifies. So, if you want to figure out what Z naught is, Z naught is just 1 over Y naught will be equal to, if I take this value of the textbook, okay, it will be 1 over 1 plus 1 over J omega plus J omega. Okay? And I just have to learn how to reciprocate that very complicated number of there. I can multiply by j omega to simplify things. Okay, if I multiply by j omega, numerator and denominator, I get j omega plus 1 minus omega squared. Okay, that would become of the denominator. I just multiply things by j omega, numerator and denominator. Did you catch it? I multiply the numerator by j omega, I multiply the denominator by j omega, numerator becomes this, denominator becomes j omega plus 1, the second term becomes 1, the last term becomes minus omega squared. Okay? And then I have to learn how to find the magnitude and phase of this thing. Okay? Magnitude and phase is rather complicated. Let's do the magnitude first. And this is my transfer function, okay? This would be my transfer function, which is the ratio of the output to the input, which is just z naught, okay? This is the output, this is the input. So z is, in fact, my transfer function, okay? And if you're able to plot the magnitude of this, I can do a number of things. I can take the magnitude of the denominator as well as the numerator. The numerator, the magnitude would be just omega. Okay, the denominator, if I take this magnitude, would be 1 minus omega squared square plus omega squared. And then I did something wrong. What else must I do there in order to make that magnitude correct in the denominator? What? I have to take the square root of the denominator as well. Okay? And that will give me the magnitude correctly. The phase is harder to take. Okay, the phase will be <coughs> harder to take. Okay, you can take the phase of the denominator first. Okay, and then just add the 90 degrees like I did before. Okay, you can take the phase of the denominator and just add the 90 degrees, but I wouldn't go through that. Okay, that is rather complicated, but let me plot this. This is rather interesting plot. When omega equals to zero, I have what value for my frequency response when omega equals to zero. 
what is the value of this thing when omega equals to zero? A DC value. Zero, right? And then, so it looks something like this around the origin. Okay? When omega is very large, what happens to this transfer function of frequency response? Omega becomes really, really large. Can you see that when omega becomes really, really large, okay, you have actually, what would the denominator look like? When omega is really, really large, which term is bigger, this term or that term? The first one would be bigger, right? Because it will be growing like omega to the fourth power, okay? And this will be omega to the two power. So this term would dominate. Omega to the fourth power, it takes further than it becomes omega to the second power. And it cannot overwhelm the numerator. It, it actually overwhelms the numerator. It becomes bigger than the numerator. So the whole thing will become like 1 over omega when omega tends to infinity. Okay, because this grows like omega fourth. You take the square root of it, it becomes omega squared, and that cancels with 1 omega over there. So this one goes like something like that. Okay, can everybody see that? Okay, and then, so this curve must drop down. It looks something like that. It looks something like that. Okay, and now you seek, you seek the physical reason as to why the frequency response is of this nature. Why is it that you cannot pass anything from the input to the output when the frequency is DC. What causes nothing to pass from the input to the output when omega equals to zero? Yes? Is this resonance? Not resonance, not resonance. There's something else happening here. Can it, anybody see? Yes? Yeah? DC, what happens at DC? It's Inductor becomes a short circuit. Very good. Okay, inductor becomes a short circuit. The output gets short circuited. Okay, because this becomes a short circuit. Okay, all the currents will pass through this short circuit and there's no voltage drop at the output. Okay, because this is a short. Okay? So that's why you have this value over there. Why does it become zero? Why does this uh, frequency response becoming zero when omega is very, very long? Yes? Capacitor becomes a short circuit. Yeah, that's very good. At very high frequency, this becomes a short circuit. The voltage, the current will go through the capacitor, having very little voltage drop. Okay, so the transfer function becomes zero. And what happens in between? What happens in between? Where do you think the peak would be? What happens to the inductor connected in parallel with the capacitor? It will resonate at one point, okay, a certain frequency. And what happens to it at resonant frequency? Capacitor, capacitor and inductor connected in parallel. It becomes an open circuit, very good. Okay, at one point, this thing together with that thing becomes an open circuit. And the only voltage, the only current can go through is this resistor over here. Okay? And that should be where the thing peak. Okay? This is, should be roughly omega equal to omega naught. Okay, roughly, not exactly, omega naught is the resonant frequency of the circuit. Okay, roughly. And then you will have the most transfer from input to output at that frequency. And this is known as a, a band pass. Filter. It allows a band of frequencies to go through. Not all high frequencies like this one, and not all low frequency like the other one that I have erased. Okay? And the phase angle is rather complicated and bizarre. Okay, I wouldn't derive that, but I just sketch it out for you. The phase angle of this system. Theta as a function of omega will look something like this. Okay. This is 
plus pi over 2, this is minus pi over 2. Okay? Okay? This is plus pi over 2, this is minus pi over 2. Um, One thing that you notice about the base angle on the three <laughs> examples that we have shown before, okay, the low pass filter, the base angle was like this. The high pass filter, the base angle was like that. The band pass filter, the base angle was like that. What commonality do you see between them? Or among them? Okay, there's one commonality you see between them or among them. What other commonality do you see? Oh, the level R at high frequency and low frequency. Okay, there's a good point. They always tend to a constant value at high frequency and low frequency. Can somebody else pick up another feature? Yes? Uh, they are all, all functions. All functions. Okay, very good. That's correct. But can somebody pick up an additional feature? You notice that the phase varies rapidly in a certain region. It always varies rapidly. Okay? When when the amplitude is very slowly. Okay, you notice that this is the case. Okay? So it varies rapidly when the amplitude is very slowly. This is one feature. Okay? It varies rapidly when the amplitude is very slowly. And this one, maybe I can stretch your imagination a little bit. Okay? It varies rapidly. Okay, when this thing is very slowly. Okay. So they tend to have this kind of feature that the phase function varies rapidly at places where the amplitude function varies slowly. You will later on learn that there is a relationship between the phase function and the frequency response, but we deal with that later on. Okay? Are there any questions regarding this? If no question, then we can go on to Another example. Example involving an ODE. Example 5.4. You are given an ODE in y dt plus 4y is equal to the f dt plus 2f. And you're saying the f is the input, y is the output. Find the frequency response or the transfer function. Okay? So if this is a system that you're working with, how do you find the h of omega, which is the ratio of the output over the input, right? But what form must the output be? You cannot put time domain form. These are functions of time. These are in the time domain. These are ODEs. These are functions of time. Okay? So the transfer function or the frequency response is the ratio of two quantities. Output over input, right? But what must do those two quantities be? What form must they be in? Phases, okay? You have to find the phasal form of the output. Let's say this is it, and then the phasal form of the input, okay? And how do I get this ratio from the ODE? I convert this equation into an algebraic form using phasal technique. And I hope you still remember that it was quite a few weeks ago now, right? A few lectures ago that we know 
and learn how to convert an ODE into a phaser form. So what we do then is that we let yt be equal to real of y e to the j omega t. And then you let uh, f of t be real of f e to the j omega t. You plug those two quantities into the ODE, and then you simplify. If you have good memory, you don't even have to do that. You can do it in, as a one-liner, right? But if you don't remember, you rewrite the form. So if I plug y, define this way into the first term, what does the first term become? J omega, t, J omega, right? You can still keep the real part there, but what happens to this dbt is that it just becomes a J omega y e to the J omega t. Or the second term, what does it become? Just capital Y, right? And then I can put e to the J omega t there if I want to. And then the right hand side, the right hand side would be J omega times capital F e to the J omega t. Okay? Plus 2 capital F. And then I'm letting the real operator be operating across this equation so that it operates both on the left hand side and the right hand side. I hope you can accept that notation. Okay? Uh, I am missing something on the right hand side. What did I miss? E to the j omega t. Okay, e to the j omega t. And then you, the next thing you argue is that this is going to happen for all time. As time progresses, this thing just goes round and round in a circle on a complex plane. Okay? So, if this is 